Lousy ale, bad service, and uh, who's that guy with the Viking axe in the corner? Welcome back to Bumblebee. It's time for the top 10 scandalous things that happened in medieval taverns. Also, make sure you stick around until the end because we're doing comments. Yep, we're doing it. Let's go. Kicking off the list at number 10, the big city. Okay, it's the 14th century. It's Saturday. You and the boys are off to have a hoot and or holler. You decide to hit the big city. Check out one of those medieval taverns that everybody is talking about. So, what should you expect? Should you get your fake ID? Should you have a, your passport? Is there a bouncer? What's covered tonight? How many rupees is covered? Well, for starters, this is a long time before Ubers. So unless you have a horse or two, you're gonna have to walk quite a bit just to get to the bar. If the Black Death didn't get you, the commute into the city definitely would. Your knees would be clicking. Living in the city was horrible. Strict curfews were put into place. Violent crimes would happen all throughout the night because obviously back in those days, there's no police force out patrolling. Just shady dudes and hoods. Just Big Ched would be in the corner with his hood up, just planning something, you know what I mean? Number nine, house special. Many of these ale brewers were women, probably because men were too busy drinking it. Ale and bread were both necessities when it came to living in the late 12th century, because there's no Taco Bell anywhere. This food's sparse. Hunting, it's all sparse. I like saying the word sparse, it's nice. Sparse. Baking bread was not freely permitted, but making ale in your basement was. Yeah, we went from making ale in our living rooms to banning alcohol. History is wild sometimes. So the higher ups, these noble lords, they wouldn't care if you made ale and had a block party and all that jazz and made all that noise, but if you made weak ale, or if it was improperly measured and then distributed, then you would get a fine. Imagine that. That's like the police busting your house party only when they get there, they turn the music up and congratulate you on a proper barrel of White Claw. Uh, yes, Black Cherry, the finest. Number eight, don't mind the rats. Oh, what's that? You're with your friends and family gathering around a table, eating and drinking and conversing, having a lovely time? Ah, be a shame if hundreds of rats started to swarm your feet while you were mid-bite, wouldn't it? Welcome to the past. The plague rolled into town back in 1328 and it lasted until like 1350. It lasted a long time. It was actually horrible. We think of the plague in history and we're like, man, was that anything like the past few years? No, not at all. I haven't seen any swarms of rats lately. I haven't gotten the Black Death. The European population was reduced by one third and rats were mostly to blame. Yeah, these quick hairy balls of yuck just scurrying through the town. I don't want any part of that. I don't like rats. I actually do not like rats. These little guys passed it on. Mid-meal, you would feel a tickle, look down. Oh, it's just the plague. Nice, just a couple of plagues waiting for crumbs to fall. Oh, how cute is that? Yep, just the bill, thanks. Number seven, BYOF. If you're passing by one of these middle-aged taverns, maybe you feel like grabbing some questionable lunch. Well, you better come prepared, my friend. Bring your own fork because we don't have any. We can't afford that. We're not blacksmith, we can't make a fork. What's a fork? We didn't have a moody server sitting in booth 11 doing roll-ups all night. This was the middle ages. If you had a fork, you took care of that fork. Forks don't grow on trees, pal. If you were lucky, these establishments would dish out a couple of spoons, maybe a couple of spoons, but forks? Nice joke, you're getting laughed at. You're watching everybody eat while you starve. Historians compared sharing forks to sharing toothbrushes. So that's, in case you're wondering, no, you're not borrowing a friend's. Oh, after you've done that bike, can I just maybe, no, get out of here, see ya, off with your head. You also didn't have a steak knife handy ever. Knives were only reserved for carvers. Until the 17th century, all you had were little daggers. You would just poke and tear through your meal. You would just poke it. Number six, ins and outs. My favorite title. I've worked here for a year and a half now, it's my favorite title. When we think of a medieval tavern or an inn, it's important to note the differences. Yes, there's drinking. Yes, it smells like dad breath all throughout the air. But inns, their sole purpose was to house travelers comfortably. Whereas the tavern, not so much housing, more of rough housing, you know what I mean? Taverns were almost a private event thing. Your neighbors would whip up some ale, light a candle, two is a company, three is a crowd, come on in, now we got a basement tavern fight club, let's party. It was that easy. That was a tavern, you now have a tavern. No license, no nothing, just come on in, look what I made, drink it. Number five, license to pour. We got inns, we got taverns, so what else? Where can we get a pint in the 1500s? I am thirsty. Well, come the time of King Henry VII, these establishments were known as pubs. I know, I'm jumping ahead here a little bit, but this is the perfect time to talk about some early pub history. Why not, just squeeze it in. By 1577, there were over 17,000 alehouses, 3,000 inns, 500 taverns, all throughout Old England. So that's one pub for every 200 people. 
That is so much ale. That's, oh my gosh. Do they work here too? This is a lot. So in order for this to take off, an act was passed in 1552. Innkeepers needed a license, so you can no longer throw a sleeping bag down, make some questionable wine in your cellar, and then call it an inn. That's not how it works. That's, we're not doing that. We're not going to your basement and sleeping and drinking your ale. It's not gonna fly anymore. Show me some license. <laughs> Show me some licenses. -es. Number four, cherry brandy. Okay, it doesn't matter if you're a noble or a knight or whatever, everybody wants to go to the pub and loosen up. Especially a young Prince Charles. Back in the day, he would often visit the local Stornoway Harbor Village pub. So yeah, you would walk up, sit next to a prince and be like, hi, can I buy you a drink? What's going on here? He would often order from the bartender in a soft voice, a cherry brandy. This prince was being discreet, but unfortunately a local reporter just happened to be sipping some crispy cold ones at the same time and overheard this guy getting his whistle wet. So now it was of course a huge scandal. A prince drinking, having fun? Number three, tavern history. Before the Middle Ages, there were still taverns, places where alcohol was sold. Of course, this goes back thousands of years. Taverns, believe it or not, existed during ancient Roman days. In ancient Greece, the Lesh, which was a fancy club, it served food to its members as well as strangers. So it was the first tavern, essentially. Ancient Greek taverns as well. Imagine making ale in flip-flops and like a little toga. I'd be so... I'd be dancing around, it'd be so light and just, nah, it wouldn't actually be horrible. It sounds like a horrible job. The Code of Hammurabi from ancient Babylonia, so around 1750 BCE, even all the way back then, they had the death penalty in place for those who improperly diluted beer. Imagine losing your head because you threw in too many hops. I'm like, uh, oops. Did you see him take a sip? He's like, mmm. They're like, oh, please. Number two, drink ale responsibly. The night is beginning to wind down. There's a guy in a piccolo playing closing time in the corner. It's, you know, it's time to hit the road. We're feeling it. Stools are going up. We're, you know, some guy's wiping something off something. How dangerous are these drunken commutes at this point? Well, back in ye olden days, there wasn't a friendly server that made sure you had some water before calling you a cab. No, in the 14th century, ale was three gallons for a penny. Nobody was cutting you off. They're like, yep, keep going. Give us your pennies, sir. Ooh, down your throat. In 1276 in Elstow, a man named Osbert Le Whale came home from a local tavern just extremely intoxicated, not looking good. So much so that he fell and hit his head on one of the many stones around his house and then, well, Bob's your uncle. Yeah, get home safe. If you're gonna drink, do responsibly and get home completely safe. And finally, number one, the ride home. Like I just said, this was a lawless time. People would go to the tavern, slam tons of ale, and then just ride a horse home. Like it was, Fine? Yeah, not a great idea at all. This is drunk driving back in the day. More often than not, these guys would fall off or get lost or pass out on their horse and just end up in a different place. Imagine an unconscious knight strolling through a village at 6 a.m. You're like, that's Eric. That's literally Prince Eric. He's gone. He's asleep. In the early 1300s, it was pretty common for your husband to just not return at all. He would just leave the bar with the lantern, not see the well in front of him, trip, fall in, and drown. Like. You couldn't see anything, there's no street lights back then. What a way to go out, horrible. There was one report of a man who was on his way home from the local tavern. He had to go to the washroom, break the seal, classic. So he decided to pull over and then go and relieve himself in the pond. But during so, he fell in and then drowned. Yeah, so back then it was just a bunch of drunk guys walking around uneven roads. So yeah, accidents are bound to happen. Guy's not even intoxicated. He's like, God, this road sucks. And before we wrap up this video, like I promised, we're gonna read some comments. These ones come from our top 10 unusual hygiene products that women used in history. This was a wild ride for me. I learned a lot of things. Emily Jalassi says, please, please, please make a part two of this one. I loved watching Taylor be just amazed at what us ladies have to deal with throughout history. I believe the word you had so much trouble with is pronounced thalidamide. Thalidamide. Thalidomide, that makes more sense than what I was saying. I had an Australian accent for some reason. I was like, thalidomide? Yeah, little boy, thalidomide. I can't read, apparently. Thalidomide, I still can't even properly say it and you wrote it out for me, thank you. Sherry Marshall says, Taylor, you did a great job explaining the personal hygiene and beauty trends, plus I learned something too. Keep up the good work, I wouldn't mind a part two. I had to point this out because you are Dr. Seuss. That was all a rhyme. I don't know if you meant to do that, but a part two will gladly come after that sweet track you just dropped after that hot diss track. I wouldn't mind a part two. Keep up the good work. How are you? What's up? Boo. I don't know. I can't rhyme as good as you. Or can I? He's good. 
Miss Lala says, almost 2,000 views in four hours. That's crazy. Taylor, you're my favorite host. Love these fellow Canadians. A Canadian, nice. It's so cold outside. It's spring, then it's not. Make up your mind, right? Also, yeah, all those views in four hours, I gotta come out here and say thank you for all your support. This channel's been growing wildly since we popped off, and turns out ancient history can be a little fun. So anything you want to see in the future, comment down below. Me and Big Chet will put our hoods up and plan something. I've been your host, Taylor McWaters, and we'll see you next time on Bumblebee. Deuces. No intro. Oh yeah, I have an intro. This is crazy. Innkeepers needed innkeepers. Yeah, innkeepers. I thought I said beekeepers. I'm like, why? What are they doing here? Big Ched would be in the corner with his hood up, just planning something. You know what I mean? He's always got his hood up. Every thumbnail I see, I'm like, what's this guy do with his hood up? So mysterious, that man.